but it's a little after 8 30 so we'll go ahead and get started welcome everybody to and tell us scratch course for a, for a treat form of another uh, great guest lecturer uh, today, Hans Renata, our former uh, script Florida colleague. By way of introduction, I'll, I'll keep this very brief since many of you in the audience know Hans well. Um, Hans received his education for undergraduate, graduate, and postdoc at Columbia Scripps and Caltech uh, with professors Lambert, Aaron, and Arnold, respectively. He began his independent career at Florida campus of Scripps Research, establishing a very vibrant research program that we're all familiar with in the interface of biocatalysis and natural products photosynthesis, biology. Servingly showered with awards and honors, pretty much the whole full house of honors, uh, NSF Career Award, NIH Mira, CNE News, Talented 12, ACS Cope Scholar. Uh, and he's been a dedicated and consistent guest lecturer for this class for, is this your third time doing it? Um, almost since the inception mm -hmm. when I started taking over as a- It is the third time. So, uh, and we are all really deeply appreciative that Hans, even though sadly now he's no longer officially affiliated with uh, Scripps, having moved to Rice recently, he's still willing to take the time out of his busy schedule to spend the morning with us, lecturing on metalloenzymes and specifically artificial metalloenzymes, which I think is a, I will just say since my time as faculty member has been a topic of increasing interest among our student body. I can say I have at least like five ORPs that have some type of artificial metalloenzyme flavor. So this is a wonderful primer that Hans put together on this topic and a very unique uh, con a set of content that he covers in this lecture. So without further ado, take it away. Um, great to have you here today. All right. Thanks, Kiri, for the introduction. Let me share my screen now. All right, it's my pleasure today to tell you about metalloenzymes, both nat natural and artificial, um, and hopefully that you'll find this lecture informative and useful. Um, I will begin with a quick overview of the different types of enzymes that nature uses. Uh, so I will start with oxygenases, which is probably the most common superfamily of metalloenzymes. Um, this is typically used in oxidation chemistry. And within that big umbrella of oxygenases, there are, uh, this can be uh, divided further into several superfamilies. Um, the P450s are probably the most famous and most well studied. These are um, porphyrin containing or iron porphyrin containing enzyme. But in addition to the P450s, there are also other types of oxygenases, uh, such as those that don't contain porphyrins. And this can be divided into um, the non heme oxygenases superfamily. Um, and I'm illustrating uh, with this ketoglutarate dependent enzyme. Uh, this is the ketoglutrate co-substrate that's used in the reaction. We'll look at the uh, reaction mechanisms shortly. Um, there's also this uh, risky oxygenase family that contains similar non-heme iron center, but it has this two iron, two sulfur risky center that's involved in um, the electron transfer to the non-heme center. Um, nature also uses uh, additional uh, types of active sites for oxidation of different substrates. Um, uh, this is also particularly well studied, uh, this enzyme here called methane mon monooxygenase that's involved in the oxidation of methane to methanol. Of course, this is a very difficult reaction to do. And nature has evolved a pretty efficient enzyme to do this, but it's a pretty difficult enzyme to study. Um, I think Amy Rosenzweig at Northwestern has been doing a lot of work on this. Um, eukaryotes also have 
copper dependent moon oxygenases um, that contains two different copper sites. I think this is involved in the oxygenation, oxidation of dopamine at the beta carbon. And just a quick terminology here uh, in, uh, for oxygenases, typically uh, this is, uh, there's a distinction to be made between monooxygenase and dioxygenase. Uh, monooxygenase uh, in its reaction, um, the um, only one oxygen atom from dioxygen will be incorporated into the substrate and the other being reduced to water. And dioxygenase, on the other hand, both oxygen atoms from dioxygen will be incorporated into the substrate. So that's the main distinction between the two, uh, the two names. In addition to this oxygenases, uh, there's also a number of different types of metal enzymes. Um, uh, this four iron four sulfur cluster is involved in a lot of interesting radical chemistry, um, but these enzymes are quite air sensitive, so it's not the easiest to work with. Uh, Ribonitrate reductase is involved in the re uh, conversion of uh, ribonucleotide to deoxyribonucleotide, so it's a pretty important enzyme in your body. And then uh, nature also has involved more exotic cofactors for a variety of chemistry. Uh, this is the canonical structure of um, hydrogenases that's involved in the conversion of hydrogen to proton and electron. Um, and I think this uh, pincer type complex is recently discovered uh, not too long ago. It has this really interesting uh, aryl nickel mo moiety uh, that's bound to two sulfur. The reaction that this enzyme catalyzes is not the most interesting. It's only involved in the racemization of lactate, but the structure is highly interesting. And then finally, we have this uh, femoco nitrogenase that contains both molybdenum and iron in this um, highly caged structure. And this is involved in the conversion of uh, nitrogen to ammonia that's important for nitrogen fixation. So today I'm gonna cover several classes of enzymes, uh, in particular those that have found um, wide utility in biocatalysis. So there's some focus on the application today. And I'm going to begin with the P450s. And as I mentioned, uh, these are uh, heme or iron porphyrin containing enzyme. Uh, this is found in the active site of the enzyme and the iron is ligated by cysteine uh, uh, at one of its axial residues. So this is actually a pretty uh, characteristic feature of P450s that's conserved in all uh, in all P450s. Uh, the enzymes are called P450s because uh, it was found that if you uh, react this enzyme with carbon monoxide, um, you will get a very distinct UV absorption peak at 450 nanometer, um, and um, this is very distinct for P450s and it's very useful for the characterization of this enzyme. Um, for the enzymes, for the P450s to be fully functional, uh, it requires additional components. Um, and in particular, these components are required for the reduction of the um, iron to, uh, or subsequent electron delivery to the iron um, for the eventual generation of an iron oxo complex. And there are many different uh, domain organizations for this reductases. Um, for example, in class one system, um, this is a three protein system where you have a standalone heme domain that contains this porphyrin. Uh, and then there, is a, there are two reductases uh, um, belonging to the FAD domain and the iron sulfur protein uh, that's involved in the delivery of electrons to the heme domain. Um, class two contains uh, Two different types of flavin containing reductases, um, FAD and FMN. We'll take a look at the structure of these two flavin components uh, in the next slide. And this can be found in either as separate proteins where the heme is a standalone enzyme and then there is a there and there's a standalone reductase uh, that would come to the to the heme for the electron delivery. But uh, there are also P450s that are self-sufficient that contains this type of fusion arrangement where the reductase is fused to the heme domain. Um, B450 BM3 is the prototypical 
example for this type of fusion arrangement and it's been widely used because of because this type of fusion arrangement just makes it a lot easier to use. Um, we'll take a look at the structure of this two FAD and FMN uh, platin containing domains uh, in the next slide. Now I'm gonna go through the canonical catalytic cycle for the P450s. Uh, and there are some important features as you will see uh, as I go through the cycle. So the resting state is this iron tree uh, that's also ligated by water. Um, upon substrate binding, this molecule of water will be displaced from the active site. And this also triggers a spin shift from low spin to high spin. And that also changes the redox potential of the iron. And that now allows uh, iron tree to be reduced to iron two under more physiological relevant condition. Um, next will come electron delivery from the reductase. This is this would first reduce the iron treated iron two. And this iron two species can then react with oxygen to first form this uh, peroxide species that can then undergo proton coupled electron transfer to generate this hydroperoxyl species that eventually loses water to generate compound one. So as you can see here, uh, the electron delivery needs to be highly uh, timed so that um, uh, the active oxidation species compound one here can be uh, properly generated. Um, and from here, uh, there's going to be a hydrogen atom abstraction from the substrate to generate a substrate radical that can then undergo radical rebound for a net hydroxylation. Um, and I'll refer you to these two papers here uh, that characterizes the property of compound one, which is the active uh, species in the oxidation chemistry. And this paper also argues that cysteine ligation is necessary so that you can increase the basicity of compound one so that this hydrogen abstraction can happen. And that's why uh, this feature is conserved in all P450s. Um, now let's take a look at the electron transfer here. Um, so this is the structure of MN, FMN and FAD. They both contain this platin heterocycle here, but they contain different terminal group. FMN ends with this phosphate and FAD uh, is ligated to this adenine. Uh, there's a mixed state in the structure here. It should be a diphosphate, um, but the general overlay is quite, uh, is basically uh, this. And the, um, the electron transfer cycle for P450 BM3 is uh, well studied. As I mentioned, uh, because of the fusion arrangement, um, uh, P450 BM3 is very convenient to study and, uh, and scientists have figured out the uh, electron transfer process in great detail. So you will start by binding NADPH in, uh, in the FAD domain, and then there will be a hydride transfer from NADPH um, to FAD uh, that would generate a reduced FAD species and oxidize NADP. Um, at this point, uh, you will displace NADP with NADPH uh, to get a new molecule of NADPH um, here. And uh, during time, there's also an electron transfer from uh, the reduced FAD species, uh, used singly, uh, electron reduced FMN, uh, to, uh, which is shown here. And then at this point, the, re uh, the singly reduced FMN. Um, can reduce the iron tree species to iron two. Um, and then another electron transfer happens from FAD to FMN. Um, and then eventually this would lead to oxygen activation and then subject hydroxylation. So as you can see here, the electron transfer process is quite complex and it's highly evolved uh, so that the reaction is efficient and can uh, properly work to generate the desired iron oxo complex. Um, and in terms of the reduced flavin species, uh, the singly reduced species is this flavin semiquinone. And it's important to note that during this cycle, uh, FMN is never reduced, it's never fully reduced to the hydroquinone and uh, it's only uh, reduced to this semiquinone species. And it's often thought that the fusion arrangement of P450 PM3 is highly uh, um, 
important for its efficient electron transfer. Um, and the thought is that there's a flexible hinge region that allows the FAD and FMN domain to swing around um, uh, to uh, facilitate electron delivery. And um, I believe that the electron transfer for P450 B entry is one of the most efficient among the P450s. Uh, this and now let's take a look at the different types of reactions that can be catalyzed by the P450s. Essentially, any, any kinds of oxidation reaction that you can think of uh, can be catalyzed with the P450s, um, ranging from hydroxylation to alkane desaturation to generate this type of alkene. Uh, you can also perform a, a nitration that we'll take a look in, in a bit. And then you can also epoxidize alkene to the corresponding epoxide. Um, in addition to alkane hydroxylation, you can also hydroxylate an aromatic ring. Um, this would uh, likely go through the aryl oxide species first, um, followed by uh, um, an ice shift type reaction. Um, you can also hydroxylate um, free amine to the corresponding hydroxyamine. And there are also p 450s that can catalyze by aryl bond formation uh, to produce this type of product. And um, and depending on the type of reaction, um, nature has used it, has been able to use uh, different intermediates in the catalytic cycle for catalysis. So for example, for epoxide formation, it's accepted in the field that nature uses compound zero, which is this hydroperoxide species to perform epoxidation. And then uh, for nitration, it's believed that the reaction proceeds from this superoxide species that can then react with an NO radical to perform to generate this proxy nitrate species that can then undergo um, homolysis to generate the iron four oxo complex and this um, active nitrating species uh, that then performs nitration. Um, and I think this is only known in the context of um, indole nitration here. Now let's take a look at P450 BMPs. And as I mentioned, this is one of the most well-studied P450s um, and this is because of the highly beneficial fused arrangement. Um, the native activity of this enzyme is a hydroxylase that perform a non-specific oxidation on long chain fatty acid. And um, since this initial report of its native activity, this enzyme has been extensively engineered to perform site selective oxidation on a variety of substrates, um, including um, pretty complex terpenes that could be relevant for um, synthesis, of course, um, including sclerolite or this type of steroid here. And I'm just going to quickly go through uh, the, um, the evolution story for uh, P450 BM3 uh, until we eventually arrive at uh, variants that can oxidize terpenes. Um, so uh, this work here um, is was predominantly performed in the Arnold lab back in the uh, in the mid '90s, I believe. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the wild type enzyme catalyzes non-specific oxidation on fatty acids, and then by performing extensive protein engineering um, throughout the whole enzyme, the Arnold group was able to identify a variant called 1393 that can perform uh, oxidation on uh, octane here. Um, and the Nova number is pretty good uh, that um, 3000 and uh, predominantly the, this variant would oxidize at C2 uh, with some uh, a side product of C3 oxidation. And then starting from 1393, um, uh, the Arnold lab has further uh, engineered this enzyme uh, to arrive at this variant called P450 PMO that can now hydroxylate propane uh, to generate isopropanol. And um, this reaction is highly efficient. Um, the over number um, is re uh, really high, 45,000. Um, and um, along the way, I think um, uh, some of the variants that are uh, that were discovered uh, during this engineering campaign uh, uh, were tested for additional activities on other substrates until, uh, and people eventually found that uh, some of these variants can actually uh, 
catalyze uh, interesting set selective oxidation on a number of different substrates, including small terpenes to medium sized terpenes. And this is uh, how we eventually arrive at um, variants that can oxidize pretty complex terpenes like this. Um, but before we take a look at this example, I, I also wanted to point out that there is an alternative approach to use P450BM3 for propane oxidation. In this case, you can simply use wild type enzyme. And the idea behind uh, this approach is to use a uh, decoy molecule that would occupy the active site of the enzyme partially, but you want this decoy molecule to not be active in the oxidation. So uh, this is developed by Manfred Reitz and um, Watanabe group um, independently. And they both came up with this perfluoro acid. And of course, uh, this acid is inert to oxidation, but it still leaves some space in the active site, active site that uh, allows propane to come in and bind and undergo uh, oxidation to isopropanol. I should also point out that there is a more um, extensive uh, study on the use of decoy molecules in this ACS catalysis paper by Osami Shoji. Um, instead of using perfluoro acid, um, his lab uses um, uh, dipeptide or tripeptide decoy molecules to pump up the, um, the activity further. And I think the latest one is that they can even use it to oxidize methane to methanol. Okay, um, now let's take a look at this example of uh, using P450 BM3 uh, to oxidize complex terpene. Uh, this is done by the Fasan lab at Rochester, uh, now at UT Dallas. Um, um, they were e able to evolve a variant called FL62. Um, um, this, is, this is actually derived from one of the variants discovered during this engineering campaign by the Arnold lab. And they found that this variant uh, can lead to the formation of three different products, namely epoxidation uh, and two different types of oxidation. And starting from FL62, they then perform further uh, engineering on the enzyme. Uh, they perform set saturation with the genesis on first pier residues, meaning residues that are uh, right within the active site of the enzyme. And set saturation with the genesis means that you are going to randomize the identity of a particular residue to 19 other amino acids. And then you're going to test the activity of the resulting variant. And by doing so, they were able to arrive at two different variants that have much improved selectivity for the two different types of bullet oxidation. So variant 12, F12, uh, give 80% selectivity for this product. And then variant 7, H11, uh, uh, give 81% selectivity for the, the other uh, all oxidation product here. Um, now I'm gonna move on to uh, iron and alpha to the glutarate dependent oxygenases. Okay, so as the name suggests, uh, this enzyme uses ketoglutarate in, the, in its reaction. Um, and this is a non-heme enzyme. It contains two histidine and one carboxylate ion binding motif. And ketoglutarate is bound uh, to the iron uh, with this binding mode. Um, uh, a unique feature of this enzyme is that um, during the oxygen activation step, um, the Iron oxygen generation is accompanied by uh, loss of CO2 from uh, this ketoglutarate acid motif. Uh, and uh, this arises through the formation of this uh, bridge peroxo species that can then collapse the iron oxo product and then loses CO2. So um, at this point, uh, you've converted that ketoglutarate to succinate here. And from this iron oxo complex, uh, the same type of hydrogen atom abstraction followed by a radical rebound can happen to generate uh, the hydroxylate product. Um, this enzyme family is first discovered in 1966, uh, and it was discovered in the context of proline hydroxylation um, that's found in collagen motif. And, and this 4 hydroxyproline motif is actually important in maintaining the triple helix structure of collagen. 
Um, and since then, there has been a lot of discoveries of other alpha KGs that can perform interesting site selective oxidation, ranging from amino acid substrates to uh, pretty complex terpenes as well as alkaloid. Um, in addition to hydroxylation, uh, the iron and alpha KG dependent dioxygenases can also perform halogenation. Uh, the main difference in the active site between the halogenases and the um, hydroxylases is that the carboxylate ligand that's present here um, in hydroxylases is replaced by uh, halide in the halogenases. So basically this residue, glutamate or aspartate, has been converted to glycine or alanine. So that would then free up a um, coordination site on iron that, uh, and that allows uh, a halide molecule to come in. Um, and from this iron oxide complex, you will perform the same type of hydrogen atom abstraction. And now the resulting substrate radical has the option of either uh, reacting with this chloride ligand or the hydroxide ligand. And um, extensive studies have shown that um, the, the halogenases have evolved in such a way that, um, uh, that it can position the substrate radical to uh, undergo selective rebound with the, um, with the halide ligand on the iron selectively um, without or with minimal site reactivity with the uh, hydroxide ligand. Um, and although I guess I should mention that this is only true if you're using the native substrate of the enzyme and the wild type enzyme. Uh, the first characterization of um, alpha KG halogenase um, is found in this um, PNAS paper in 2005. This enzyme is called SIRB2, and this was done by uh, Bollinger and Krabs lab at Penn State. Um, and uh, this enzyme actually uh, catalyzes the halogenation of trinine to provide the following product. Um, but uh, this trinine needs to be bound onto a carrier protein for the reaction to happen. Um, so this is the structure of the, uh, of the R group here. Uh, so it has a CoA motif that's then bound to the actual carrier protein. And they also noted that um, even though uh, the reaction with trinine um, gives selective chlorination, if they change the substrate from trinine to norvaline CERB1, the reaction primarily gives hydroxylation. So as you can see, uh, um, the positioning of the substrate or the identity of the substrate is highly important uh, for selective halogenation here. And in addition, um, in this Nature Chem Bio paper, the Bollinger and Krabs groups have also shown that you can also perform um, acidation or nitration with CERB2 um, if you simply replace the uh, chloride in your buffer with um, azide or uh, nit nitrite. Um, and I should point out though that this reaction was only, only performed under stoichiometric conditions and they, don't, they didn't even get, um, they on, I think they only obtained rather mo modest yield for the acidated or nitrated product here. Since this initial discovery of halogenase on, um, that acts on substrates that are bound to carrier protein, um, there are, there are also halogenases that have been found to perform reaction on standalone substrate. Um, the first one was characterized from the Velvetin dolinone biosynthesis. Uh, it was found that the, this chlorination here uh, is catalyzed by a uh, alpha KG halogenase called WELL05. There's also a related enzyme called MO5 that's about 79% uh, identical in sequence to WELL05 and it was shown to have less stringent separate specificity than well O5. And um, this Anguanta paper here uh, uh, performed some fusion experiment um, that allows the researchers to alter the regional selectivity of the reaction um, while maintaining the <clears throat> promiscuity level of MO5. 
Now you might think that if you want to convert a hydroxylase to halogenase, the only thing that you need to do is to mutate that um, glutamate or aspartate to alanine or glycine, and then add chloride or bromide in your assay. But that's not uh, that sounds good on paper, but it's actually uh, not that um, um, realistic to do. Uh, um, so let's take a look at this paper from Ron Range in 2009 that uh, described their attempt to do that mutation. And they found that just by simply swapping out a glutamate residue in proline, proline hydroxylase um, to alanine or glycine, um, they did not observe any chlorination at all. And in fact, the enzyme that they obtained is completely non-functional, doesn't, doesn't perform hydroxylation, doesn't perform chlorination. So this illustrates the challenge in converting hydroxylase to halogenase. In 2016, the Bowl group was able to obtain a crystal structure of well O5. And by noting the interaction of the, uh, that's found in the active set of the enzyme, um, they thought that uh, this serine 189 here could be a candidate for mutagenesis um, to, um, to give uh, chlorination activity on well, um, sorry, to give hydroxylation activity on well O5. And indeed, by performing this mutagenesis, uh, they start seeing some level of hydroxylation uh, with well O5. Since then, this has become a rather active area of research. Um, and there is a number of reports that have shown that, the, uh, that it's actually viable to convert hydroxylase to halogenases with the different halogenases with the differing levels of efficiency. Um, this chem biochem paper um, started with a proline hydroxylase called SMP4H. Um, and the Wildcat enzyme gives a little bit of halogenation activity upon uh, mutating that uh, carboxylate residue to, I uh, don't remember whether this is glycine or alanine. And then uh, starting from this initial discovery, the scientists uh, on this paper then perform a few rounds of directed evolution that allows them to uh, increase the ratio of halogenation to hydroxylation somewhat and bump up the catalytic efficiency of the reaction by about 100 fold. Um, Michelle Chang last year uh, uh, reported this strategy to engineer halogenous activity in, um, in a lysine hydroxylase. Um, so the context here is that prior to this report, they were able to identify two uh, distinct enzymes that can perform divergent hydroxylation or halogenation on lysine. Um, and they found that um, this halogenation is relevant in the context of formation of this um, um, alkyne containing amino acid. And they thought that this can be a useful um, reporter uh, um, to, as a proxy to identify um, the, acti the activity of the halogenase. Um, so the idea here is that if you uh, incorporate the halogenase um, in this pathway with these two additional enzymes, you will generate this alkyne containing amino acid that you can then detect by click chemistry um, um, and that would install a fluorophore that you can, and you can quantify the amount of uh, um, the fluorescent intensity that, that's used as a proxy for the amount of chlorinated lysine that's produced in the assay. Okay, so with this idea, they then generate a um, shuffling library um, from Hydrox D144G and HAL. Um, uh, this basically means that you're going to chop up um, um, these two enzymes at different portions and then recombine them uh, to generate a, um, a library of variants. Uh, they then use this photometric assay for hydroput screening and, and then use the resulting data from this hydroput screening to get sequence function insights to identify key residues that they should mutate to install halogenous activity in hydrox. And by doing so, they can simply uh, 
install three mutations on hydrox, and that's sufficient to give about 84% selectivity for chlorination. Okay, and the last example that I'm going to talk about is this um, engineering of SAT A enzyme. Um, SAT A is a hydroxylase that perform hydroxylation on aliphatic amino acid at C3, but it requires the presence of this succinate group on the alpha amino group for the reaction to happen. Um, the bold group at Penn State previously found that they can mutate uh, that um, aspartate residue on SAT8 to glycine um, and uh, use it for halogenation of this N-succinyl uh, leucine. However, this is only done um, under stoichiometric condition. Uh, so it's a single turnover experiment. And at the same time, hydroxylation actually predominates in the reaction. But earlier this year, the Lewis group at Indiana University showed that uh, they can use this as a starting point for a directed evolution campaign to install acidation activity on um, SAT A. Um, so the um, the premise is still uh, the same. Um, you simply swap out uh, chloride for azide, and then you start from SAT A D one five seven G. In this case, they added this um, maltose binding protein to increase the solubility of SAT A. Um, and initially, they found that the that this initial construct here gave about fourteen percent yield of um, the desired acidic product. And by performing extensive directed evolution, uh, I think this was just coupled with LCMS screening, they're able to obtain a variant with multiple mutations that give 21% yield for uh, um, acidated leucine. And they also showed that uh, um, the reaction has rather broad subgrade scope. Um, and these are the types of products that they can obtain um, uh, using the different variants that they um, uh, identified throughout their evolution campaign. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to move on to risky diogenases. Uh, the defining feature of this diogenases is the presence of this risky center, um, which is this uh, two iron, two sulfur um, uh, motif here. This was first identified in the degradation of aromatic compounds by Pseudomonas putida. And eventually it was found to be a three component system, naphthalene and toluene dioxygenase. And the three components are flavin dependent reductase, pyridoxin, and terminal oxygenase. So it's kind of like a hybrid between a P450 and non team enzyme in, in the sense that you have this multiple component reductases um, uh, that's involved in electron transfer. Um, to generate the reactive species in the uh, non-heme center. Okay, so the reductase use NADH or NADPH, um, and then this in turn would then reduce um, the ferredoxin domain, and the ferredoxin domain can then uh, reduce the oxygenase domain uh, so that it can generate the, the requisite iron oxo species. And the uh, Proposed mechanism for adding hydroxylation is shown here. Um, it's thought that um, you will first form this bridge um, peroxo species. And from here, the reaction can either proceed through a direct engagement of the alkene with one of the oxygen. Um, and the resulting radical here can then um, react with the iron oxo uh, motif to uh, generate the, the hydroxylate product. Alternatively, uh, this species can uh, decompose to this iron oxo complex, and that can then perform um, um, a net hydroxylation on the arene to form the product. And then there needs to be a, a proton transfer and also electron transfer to regenerate the resting state of the enzyme. Uh, there are some challenges with this system. Um, Anytime you work with multi-component enzyme, it's always a challenge. And this is further compounded by the oxygen sensitive nature of iron sulfur cluster. In general, if you see any iron sulfur cluster, it's safe to assume that it would be quite air sensitive. And at the same time, um, 
It also lacks a distinct chromophore for spectroscopic studies, and that makes mechanistic study uh, rather difficult with this enzyme. One way that people have gotten around uh, this issue is just by uh, using hydrogen peroxide as the oxidant in the reaction. Um, that's useful if you just want to perform activity assay of the enzyme, um, but uh, in general, the uh, Catalytic activity is not as good if you, if you use hydrogen peroxide as oxidant in the reaction. Um, despite these challenges, there are additional risky deoxygenases that have been uh, characterized. Um, some of them are involved in the oxidation of amines, um, um, such as this enzyme PRND that's involved in pyrrole nitrine, pyrrole nitrine biosynthesis. Uh, so this enzyme oxidizes this aniline to the corresponding nitro product. Um, this has been studied quite a bit by women Xiao, um, and they showed that it can accept, the enzyme can accept additional substrates uh, such as uh, this. And they also have been able to perform some mechanistic studies that indicated the presence of various intermediates. Um, so the aniline motif is oxidized sequentially to the hydroxylamine, and then to the nitro, so then undergoes conversion to the nitro product. And they've done a little bit of limited engineering to improve the catalytic efficiency of the enzyme as well, based on molecular meddling. I think the most interesting example of, a, of risky deoxygenases can be found here, which is uh, found in the biosynthesis of the prodigiosin nitro products. Um, there's a number of enzymes uh, called REDG, MCPG, and MARG that can uh, perform uh, a net alkylation um, in a set selective fashion to generate uh, divergent products uh, um, depending on the enzyme use. Um, and of course, it's very difficult to control. Um, you just think about this from a um, the action utility standpoint, it's very difficult to perform set selective sheets alkylation like this um, using any uh, traditional chemistry. And um, it's thought that the reaction happens through set selective hydrogen atom abstraction from the long chain alkane. And this can then undergo um, um, radical addition to the parole motif on, uh, on the precursor to generate different ring sizes. And then finally, I'm gonna. I'm, I also would like to point out that there are there are also non-heme diiron enzymes that uh, can perform oxidation chemistry. Um, uh, there aren't that many that have been uh, identified so far, and they're usually uh, found in the context of oxidation of anilin to uh, aromatic nitro compounds. Um, this is found. Uh, for this there are two enzymes that are known to perform this reaction. First is called RF, which is found in the aureotin biosynthesis pathway, and also CMLI, which is found in the context of chloramphenicol biosynthesis. And I think they've uh, been able to obtain a crystal structure of the enzyme uh, of RF, I believe. And uh, this is the uh, active site geometry of the enzyme. You see the two iron here, and there's a bridging oxo group and an extensive ligation by a uh, combination of um, histidine and uh, carboxylates. Um, a few years ago, um, Ben Shen at Scripps Florida found uh, this interesting enzyme called PTMU3 that, that is also a non-heme diiron monooxygenase mm -hmm. that can perform site selective oxidation on uh, this n corin type substrate at this carbon here. Um, however, the reaction needs this uh, CoA motif um, to work, and they've also been able to uh, obtain a crystal structure of the enzyme, and this is the uh, active site picture. Um, again, you have two iron that's ligated with a combination of histidines and carboxylates, and they also were able to, uh, uh, I think, uh, I guess they were able to obtain a crystal structure with um, substrate bound uh, in the active site of the enzyme and show why they need this um, CoA motif um, for the reaction to happen. And if you're interested in the 
uh, proposed mechanism of the reaction. I'll uh, draw your attention to this uh, inorganic chemistry paper in 2021. Um, and so far, we've taken a look at mostly iron or di-iron enzymes. Um, but earlier this year, the Riddle group at UC Berkeley uh, uh, disclosed this interesting finding um, where they were able to find an enzyme called AIBH1H2 that actually contains mixed iron and manganese um, metal in its um, um, active site. Um, and I'm just going to show a couple assays that they perform uh, to uh, support this hypothesis. Um, so they found that if you simply use iron um, in in their activity assay or in their growth media, you get very poor reconstitution of activity. But they found that if they supplement manganese, um, they actually get much better activity. And in this uh, graph here, uh, they used two different uh, types of uh, reconstituted enzyme. Uh, so first they have this MN um, AIBH1H2. That means that they uh, reconstitute the enzyme um, in in just manganese first, and then after that, they assay the resulting enzyme with iron or manganese, and they found that if they assay the enzyme with um, in the presence of iron, they get much better um, oxidation activity. But in contrast, if they reconstitute um, the enzyme to be purely in the pure iron form, and then they try to supplement manganese in the reaction, they observe very poor activity. Um, so that's a uh, couple of experiments to support that this enzyme uses both iron and manganese. They also have additional um, spectroscopic studies um, that further support the presence of manganese in the active site of the enzyme. And I believe that this is the first report of the use of the incorporation of manganese in the um, in this type of uh, um, oxygenase enzyme for, to perform hydroxylation chemistry. That was a quick clarifying question. Is that the native substrate? The... Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is the native reaction of the enzymes. Uh, so it's involved in the production of uh, the metal serine from this AIB uh, amino acid. I guess any additional question about oxidation chemistry before we move on to um, some radical chemistry? Um, I had a quick question. Yeah. Uh, the presentation you showed um, some hydroxylations of different terpenes, and it seemed yeah. they almost always happened in an allylic position, but not always. Is that, yeah, on this slide, is that pretty standard? That these hydroxylations would happen there, or is it uh, um, complex than just that? It's probably the easiest site to oxidize based on thermodynamics, but you, uh, but there's definitely there has been engineering efforts to uh, move away from um, allylic sites, so you can oxidize at completely non-activated, unactivated sites. Um, Thank you. Okay. Okay, let's move on to radical chemistry with enzymes. And I am going to briefly cover radical SEM enzymes. Um, and as the name suggests, the enzymes use um, adenosyl methionine as a cofactor in the reaction. Uh, so this is a combination of methionine and uh, adenosyl here. And all radical SEM enzymes use 4-iron, 4-sulfur cluster. Uh, this chem ref here is a very extensive resource uh, that's all, that will be very useful if you want to learn more about radical SEM enzymes. Um, and um, the general mechanism for radical generation is shown here. So you'll have your s adenosylmethionine bound to the ion sulfur cluster. And um, 
there's going to be one electron delivery uh, to first reduce the iron sulfur cluster. And this can then um, um, uh, lead to homolysis of the SAM species uh, to generate this 5 deoxy adenosyl radical and methionine that's still bound to the uh, iron. Um, I should also point out that the same radical intermediate can be generated from adenosyl cobalamin, but um, whose structure is shown here, but today we're not going to talk about um, cobalamin. Um, some energetic considerations for radical SAM enzyme. The reduction potential for free SAM is about minus 1.8 volt. And on the other hand, the reduction potential of four iron four sulfur cluster is about minus 500 to minus 600 millivolt. So if you consider this two reduction potential in isolation, in theory, the, the radical generation here is energetically unfavorable. So um, it's thought in the field that the um, enzyme has something to do um, in order to make uh, this process energetically favorable. Um, there's also the selectivity consideration uh, in the um, CS bond cleavage. So in theory here, there are three different CS bond that you can cleave um, upon electron transfer. Um, and nature is able to selectively form 5 deoxyadenosyl radical. And the current thought in the field is that if you look at the crystal structure here, um, the, the CS bond that's bound, that's connected to the adenosyl motif um, is uh, basically um, right next to the iron um, here in the iron sulfur cluster. So uh, it suggests that there's some orbital overlap between this um, um, iron um, sulfur bond and this, um, and I guess the sigma star bond of this CS bond that allows for selective uh, generation of this 5 deoxy uh, adenosyl radical. Um, so in essence, the nature is able to um, control the geometry of the complex here so that uh, um, orbital overlap uh, would determine which CS bond is cleaved in the reaction. Let's briefly take a look at some reactions that uh, are catalyzed by radical SAM enzymes. Um, these are all radical chemistry. Um, uh, let's take a look at the biosynthesis of biotin catalyzed by this enzyme called BioB. Um, uh, so this involves insertion of a sulfur atom uh, at these two carbons. So successful reconstitution of this enzyme showed the presence of one four iron four sulfur and one two iron two sulfur cluster per enzyme monomer. And um, the four iron four sulfur cluster is likely involved in catalysis and uh, the two iron two sulfur is degraded and is used as a uh, sacrificial motif, if you will, to install that uh, sulfur in biotin. And the mechanism is proposed to happen like this. Um, so in the presence of bio B, um, SAM can undergo um, making of 5 adenosyl, 5 de uh, deoxyadenosyl radical that can then perform hydrogen atom abstraction from this metal group to get this metal radical. This can then uh, react with the sulfur in this two iron two sulfur cluster to generate this CS bond. And then this process is repeated again where you generate the, the same five uh, the oxyadenosyl radical that then abstracts the hydrogen from here. And this can then attack the sulfur to form this five member sulfur product and then uh, leads to the degradation of the two iron to sulfur cluster. And a similar mechanism is proposed to happen in the reaction of lip A, uh, uh, which is involved in the biosynthesis of lipoic acid in the installation of this two sulfur here. So again, the same type of process, um, you generate a um, alkyl radical uh, from H atom abstraction by 5 deoxyadenosyl radical. This can then attack um, one of the sulfurs in the iron sulfur cluster.
to form that CS bond, and then the process is repeated again until we get to this product here. Um, in addition to sulfur insulation, uh, uh, some members of the superfamily can perform CC coupling. Um, let's take a look at this example with Tun B, um, um, which is involved in the biosynthesis of tunicamycin. Uh, in this case, uh, once you generate that 5 deoxyadenosyl adenosyl radical, it will perform hydrogen atom abstraction at this carbon to generate this um, radical species. It can then uh, perform addition to this activated alkene uh, to, to give a net CC coupling um, to give this product here. And this is for the process to produce tunicamycin. Um, Although some of these reactions are highly interesting, the biggest challenge with iron sulfur cluster is that they are quite energy sensitive, so they're not the easiest to work with. And I think that has hampered their biocatalytic application so far. Okay, let's turn to artificial metal enzymes. Um, Kiri said that uh, there have been a number of ORPs involving artificial metal enzymes. So this seems to be a rather uh, popular topic at Scripps. Um, just to quickly go through the definition, an artificial met metal enzyme is an unnatural enzyme that's derived from the insertion of catalytically competent metal cofactor into a protein scaffold. And there are several strategies for incorporating uh, that metal cofactor into a protein scaffold. Um, the general idea is that usually you try to uh, import uh, the types of organometallic species that you will see in um, catalysis, um, but then you need to put on some type of uh, anchoring group into the, into the ligand on the metal so that it can be incorporated into the active site of the enzyme or the protein. And there, there's a number of ways that you can do this. You can uh, generate a covalent bond between the ligand and, um, and the nucleophilic residue in the active site of the enzyme. Um, you can also uh, do some type of supramolecular recognition, uh, and this exploits the high affinity of certain scaffolds with particular substrates. Um, um, if you don't want to do this type of anchoring or equivalent bond formation, you can also uh, use uh, coordinating residues in the active site of the enzyme uh, for native bonding to the metal species. And then finally, there's also some effort in doing metal substitution um, on certain cofactors as we will take a look. Uh, the first demonstration of artificial metal enzyme was actually reported by Whiteside in this paper in 1978, um, 45 years ago. Or, yeah. Um, so they showed that they can incorporate um, this biotin rhodium species um, into uh, this other pro this protein called apidin, and they can perform hydrogenation uh, with decent EE and uh, relatively good turnover number. Um, and let's take a look at how this system works. Um, so, uh, biotin, a, uh, um, sorry, apidin or streptof um is a tetrameric protein that's capable of binding biotin with high affinity. The KD is um, Look at the KD here, it's 10 to the minus 14 molar. So basically it's almost like a covalent bond, if you will, um, in the active site. Um, this biotin is tightly bound um, into um, avidin or streptavidin. Um, and I should point out that um, biotin, uh, the crystal structure of uh, streptavidin uh, with bound biotin molecule, um, has been solved before. So uh, people typically refer to this crystal structure uh, to identify residues that they can mutate to optimize the activity of their artificial metal enzyme further. Okay, so um, since then, this system has been revisited a couple times. Um, I think the, the general consensus is that um, the white size report is quite hard to reproduce, so um, people have been trying to uh, come up with a more robust system um, to make this reaction work. Um, so in the late 90s, this paper here showed that uh, you can use a different type of rhodium complex bound to uh, uh, 
uh, gathered the biotin um, and used in combination with apatin for um, asymmetric hydrogenation with decent EE, um, but with low turnover. Manfred Reeds also tried a pepain system um, where he used this melamine motif um, to react with a cysteine in papain, um, but they get very low EE, um, and they, I don't think they ever revisited the system again. Since this initial report, Tom Ward uh, did a pretty extensive systematic study um, on this construct by playing around with the identity of the ligand on the rhodium, and also at the same time perform mutations um, on streptapidin. Uh, this residue here is the residue they targeted for mutation. And um, by performing the systematic study, they were able to obtain much better conversion and also much improved EE. And importantly, they can get high EE either for the R or the S enantiomer, depending on the ligand that they use on, uh, on rhodium. And I think since this initial uh, systematic study by Tom Ward, uh, the field uh, then uh, started to explode. Um, and the Ward group has developed many uh, interesting system um, to adapt this artificial metal enzyme platform for a variety of organ metallic reactions. Basically any, any kind of organ metallic reaction that you can think of, you can attach your phosphine ligand or uh, your favorite ligand into biotin and then anchor it into streptavidin or apidin. Um, in 2016, they applied this to cross-coupling chemistry um, to uh, perform asymmetric biaral bond formation with 90% EE. Um, the NOVA number is usually still uh, rather low and uh, I guess a few um, um, a few fold um, lower than natural enzyme. Um, um, and in 2012, they also showed that you can adapt this platform for sheet activation. Um, this is actually done in collaboration with the Rufus group. Um, uh, they use this uh, uh, Kramer type ligand on rhodium uh, that's then anchored into streptavidin. And they found that they can get a very high regioselective selectivity ratio, good EE, uh, and once again, decent turnover number. Um, in 2016, they also showed that they can adapt this to ring closing metathesis, but they showed that they can also couple this with in vivo directed evolution. So previously, I believe that they have to uh, generate the construct one by one, uh, and that makes screening more tedious. And here they outline a workflow for doing directed evolution so that they can screen uh, many more variants uh, using this idea. Um, and the idea here is that they are going to perform ring closing metathesis to generate a product that's fluorescent. And they're going to use this ruthenium catalyst that contains a biotin motif uh, that can uh, be incorporated into the into streptavidin. So this is the workflow. They're going to they generated a Newton library that's then expressed on 96 well plate. And then um, after they're done expressing the enzyme. Um, they would resuspend the pellet in cofactor buffer. And at this point, they incorporated um, their ruthenium biotin um, um, complex uh, so that, and this is incubated for 30 minutes so that uh, to give sufficient time for uh, the complex to be incorporated to streptaphidin. And then they then spin down and discard supernatant to get rid of any additional, any excess ruthenium complex. And at this point, they then resuspend the pellet in reaction buffer at their substrate. And then uh, since their product is fluorescent, they can simply for, uh, perform a fluorescent assay to identify any active mutants. In addition to streptapidin, uh, the Lewis group has also uh, worked with this prolyl oligopeptidase scaffold uh, to generate different type of artificial matter enzyme. They chose this scaffold for a number of reasons. Um, it's, um, this uh, protein has a cylindrical shape with very large internal volume. Um, so that would give enough space to uh, anchor rather bulky cofactor. Um, and in their approach, they're going to anchor uh, their um, organometallic complex through um, acyl alkyne cyclo addition. 
Uh, so this is one regime cofactor that they use, and um, and to perform that azide alkyne click chemistry, they need um, um, acidophenyl alanine in the active site of the enzyme. So they have to introduce acidophenyl alanine residue through amber suppression. And they've done this in the context of carbene chemistry. Okay, so let's take a look at how they, uh, let's take a look at their workflow here. Um, so they first perform error prone PCR into a subdomain of this POP ligase or uh, POP scaffold. Um, and, uh, and once they have their um, mutants, they would then transform E. coli with their mutants and then express everything in anti-6 well plate. And I guess I should also mention that the E. coli also contains the necessary plasmid to incorporate acidophenyl alanine. Um, so at this point, after they express all this uh, mutants in 96 well plates, all the different variants should uh, contain different mutations as well as, as incorporation of acidophenyl alanine in the active site. At this point, they introduce the cofactor um, and give sufficient time for the um, uh, cycle addition to happen. And then they added this sephiros azide uh, bead uh, so that they can um, basically uh, pluck away any excess cofactor that's uh, unreacted in the reaction. Um, and, and then they perform centrifugal filtration. And um, now you have an uh, artificial metal enzyme library that's ready for use. And they assay this for cyclopropanation reaction on serine derivatives. And they were able to identify several variants that give um, pretty good yield with high EE for cyclopropanation with um, donor receptor carbenes. And they also showed that um, the same workflow can be used to identify variants that can perform um, CS insertion uh, on uh, cyclohexadiene uh, with uh, decent uh, ER here. Okay, I'm gonna briefly cover other protein scaffolds that have been used for artificial metal enzyme creation. Uh, this one is by Ruffles, reported in 2015. Here they use this protein called the focal multi-drug resistant regulator. Once again, this protein has a large hydrophobic pore um, and it's also homodimeric. Um, and in this case, they incorporate this bipyridine ligand in the um, supposed active site of the uh, protein or the hydrophobic pore of the protein through amber suppression. And they, they use this uh, to bind copper uh, in the pore. And they show that this construct can be used to perform um, an anti-selective uh, friedel craft reaction um, using uh, this substrate. Uh, I believe that they need this motif uh, so that you can coordinate to the copper. Um, a different strategy is reported here in another paper by the Ruffles group. In this case, instead of using amber suppression, they simply use a tryptophan residue in the pore. And now they introduce a copper complex that contain uh, this uh, ligand. Um, and this relies on hydrophobic interaction between this uh, fan ligand and the two tryptophan residues in the uh, pore. Okay, um, additional strategies that you can use to uh, incorporate your organometallic complex into different enzymes. Um, you can anchor uh, uh, into turing hydrolase by using this um, phosphonate group. Um, I guess this is kind of like the ABPP chemistry that Ben Gravatt has developed um, back in the days um, for uh, profiling serine hydrolase. Um, and in this ChemCom paper, uh, it was shown that this is successful in, in incorporating this ruthenium complex into cutanase. Um, and you can also anchor onto chemotrypsin. Um, um, and this is reported in 2012 here, where the uh, authors of the study were able to incorporate um, this um, metathesis uh, catalyst into chemotrypsin. All right, now I'm gonna move on to metal substitution for 
uh, creating artificial metal enzyme. Uh, this has been made popular by John Hartwick in the past few years. Um, and this is done in the context of uh, generating uh, artificial metal enzyme that contains um, metal porphyrin for carbene transfer chemistry. Um, so the scaffold that they use is myoglobin. And in order to, and myoglobin itself um, is, um, is a protein that's used for ocean trans transport in our body. And it contains this um, um, iron porphyrin uh, um, that's ligated by a histidine residue. Um, so in order to have the enzyme not, exp not contain um, iron porphyrin, they developed this protocol here where they first uh, express uh, myoglobin under minimal iron um, and then purify the resulting uh, product with nickel column. So at the end of that process, they will generate a um, apoprotein that does not contain any cofactor. And then they can incorporate the uh, any type of metalloporphyrin that they want uh, just by simply adding it into the reaction or into their, into their apoprotein. And they try this with a variety of um, metals or, or metal containing protoporphyrin 9. And then they tested the resulting construct um, in this insertion reaction. And they found that the reaction works the best when they use um, this iridium protoporphyrin complex. Um, and um, it's also ligated by a metal group on one of the active, on the actual uh, site. Um, and Starting from this discovery, they then perform rather extensive mutagenesis on um, myoglobin. Myoglobin itself is a rather small protein. I think it only has about 150 residues. So there's only limited residues that you can mutate that also makes it easier um, for their um, mutagenesis campaign because I believe that they, um, in this study at least, they have to express all of this point mutations uh, individually uh, and then purify uh, before incorporating the iridium complex. Um, by performing this mutagenesis, they were able to identify um, several different variants that give um, good activity while also giving uh, uh, divergent stereochemical outcome. Um, and this is just a quick overview of the types of products that they can obtain using the scalpel. And starting from this initial discovery, they can also incorporate um, iridium porphyrin complex into a P450 called CYP119. CYP119 is a thermostable P450 from S. sulfatericus. And, and after extensive mutagenesis on this scaffold, they can perform um, intermolecular CH insertion on this uh, substrate uh, with 55% yield and 68% EE. Okay, um, so that's for artificial metal enzyme. Any question about that uh, at this point before I move on to uh, carbon nitrogen chemistry uh, with uh, natural heme proteins? Okay, so, yep. Just one quick question. Can you, can you remind us of what's the state of the art in terms of for this, this Hartwig style approach? Um, have they had success with um, moving to any whole cell systems that avoid making the. Equal? Yes, they have. Yeah, they have uh, come up with. Uh, whole cell system uh, to do that. I think what they did is to introduce a uh, some type of uh, porphyrin, some type of protein that can transport metal porphyrin uh, from the media to the cells. So they can simply uh, add the porphyrin, the metal porphyrin into the uh, culture medium. And at the end of the culture process, they will already have um, um, Myoglobin variant or CYP119 variant that has that iridium porphyrin in it. They culture the cells in the low iron environment. I believe so, yeah, in the presence of a. Uh, I need it. Mm -hmm.
All right. If you don't want to use metal substitution for carbene nitrogen transfer, you can actually also use natural team proteins that contains iron for the same chemistry. Uh, this was popularized by the Arnold group, um, but based on an uh, initial report from Breslow, I would say. Um, so the idea is rather simple. Um, um, the iron oxo complex or iron one, um, uh, compound one into 450 is similar um, electronically and structurally uh, with iron or iron carbonoid or iron nitrinoid. Uh, and they thought that if you start from um, that is a compound or an um, azide, you should be able to generate the corresponding iron carbonoid or iron nitrinoid that can then perform um, uh, your favorite carbon nitrogen chemistry. And there's some precedent from uh, the literature. I think this was by Tom Kadadek in 1995, they, uh, who showed that uh, use iron TPP, uh, you can perform cyclopropanation on styrene with ethyl diazoacetate. And Ron Breslow in 1985 showed that you can use rapidly per P450 to perform intramolecular emanation, even though with very low turnover. Um, so in 2013, the Arnold group reported that you can indeed uh, repurpose P450 BM3 variants for cyclopropanation reaction. Um, and they also found that uh, mutations of the actual cysteine to serine is actually beneficial for cyclopropanation activity. Um, and since this report, they also showed that you can do a variety of reaction, um, um, carbon uh, transfer reaction. So for example, you can do NH insertion onto anilines um, uh, with decent yield and turnover, uh, even though the reaction is not angioselective. So I think if you have a, a alpha substitution here, you don't get any EE at all. And concurrently, they also develop an angioselective emanation and supplementation uh, from the corresponding AZ precursor. In this Anguanta paper here, they uh, they did intramolecular emanation uh, in an angioselective fashion. And then uh, a year later, they showed that they can do intermolecular nitrogen transfer by using fossil azide and this um, thioether to, to generate this type of supplementate uh, product. Um, I guess I should also point out that Rudy Passan has also done complementary studies with myoglobin, um, and it's reported uh, in all of these papers here. Um, and since this initial discovery, the Arnold group has been working on uh, more challenging reactions uh, using um, P450 or P411 variants. Sorry, I, I guess I should point out that P411 uh, is their code name for P450s that have been uh, mutated uh, at its actual position from cysteine to serine. Um, this is called P450, P411 because the uh, SORE peak shifts from 450 to 411 upon uh, CO assay. Okay, so uh, in 2019, they reported uh, this intermolecular CH insertion reaction um, using a P411 variant. Uh, they started with this um, um, benzyl substrate. Um, um, in their initial reaction discovery, and then use it also in their um, subsequent muta uh, mutagenesis campaign. Um, they first uh, only detected very low level of activity. I think it might be in a single digit turnover number. And then upon many, many rounds of directed evolution, they were able to eventually identify a variant uh, called CHF that is highly active for um, CH insertion. You can see that turnover numbers is in the, uh, it's around 2000 and the EE is very high, um, and it's, uh, um, and, uh, they showed that it can do this reaction on a variety of substrates, uh, 12 examples uh, for insertion at the benzylic position. Uh, they can also perform shits insertion at other positions like this. And then finally, they also showed that it can also insert at the alpha positions of fully substituted amines like this. And in all cases, the, the EE is generally pretty good. Um, a couple of years before this report, they also showed that 
uh, related variant can catalyze intermolecular CH emanation uh, um, at benzylic positions um, um, by using tosyl azide as the nitrogen precursor. Um, and as you see here, previously the reaction only worked on uh, uh, sulfur containing substrate, which is a lot more, a lot easier uh, to react. Um, and they eventually found that um, this variant called P411 CHA can perform um, CH emanation, benzylic CH emanation with tosyl A site. And then the next progression is that they can use alternative nitrogen source so that you don't end up with this tosyl amide in your product. And uh, I think they were inspired by Bill Morandi's chemistry uh, that showed that you can use um, this um, P411 um, species for uh, emanation, and they eventually found that uh, people, several people 11 variants can use this um, nitrine precursor uh, to generate a uh, uh, formerly a naked nitrine, if you will, and perform CS emanation. So now you're getting closer to mimicking the um, that um, compound one species because now you're generating a naked nitrine here in the reaction. Um, this paper, in this paper, the reaction scope is still limited to benzylic and um, allylic substrates, but I think they have a paper earlier this year or last year that showed that they can start doing emanation on unactivated substrate uh, using the same uh, um, p salt. Okay, the last thought, the last uh, reaction that I'm gonna cover is this Atom transfer radical cyclization BP450 that was developed by Yang Yang, um, reported in 2021. Uh, so far, we've only seen nitrine and carbon transfer chemistry with P4 with uh, engineered P450s, but now they also show that you can also perform atom transfer radical chemistry with P450. Um, so they started with this type of substrate and um, they came up with this variant called P450 eight years. ATR case that can uh, start to, uh, that can uh, form this type of lactam products with um, good turnover numbers and general uh, and um, I guess decent to very high EE. Um, and they also showed that um, depending on the variant that they use, they can get different uh, diastereomer of the product. So. Um, I didn't show the name of the variant, but um, take my word that there's, there's one variant that can give this diastereomer from the same uh, um, from the same precursor, and there's another uh, variant that give an alternative diastereomer from the from the same precursor, even though the ER here is not as good. Um, and in addition to five-membered lactam, they can also form four-membered lactam as well as six-membered lactam. And this, this is the mechanism that's proposed by the authors. Um, this is also supported by DFT calculation. Um, uh, they propose that there is a um, halogen bonding uh, between that halide motif on the uh, substrate um, and this would then uh, lead to uh, homolysis to generate this um, acyl radical that can then perform, um, um, I guess in this case, a 5 exo radical cyclization. And then the resulting radical species here can then undergo radical rebound with the iron bromide to generate the desired product. Um, they have a follow-up paper in 2022 uh, that discussed the role of a uh, hydrogen bonding in the active site. Uh, for antio control, so they believe that there is a, I think there is a glutamate residue that's uh, coordinating to this um, carbonyl of the lactam uh, to direct the chemical outcome of the reaction. Okay, so that is all I have for today's lecture. I'll be happy to take any questions um, and thank you for your attention. Uh, 
uh, just for my own orientation, like the, the um, P450 reactions that you showed at the end, that has for radical addition and nitrine carbonate for these non-data functions. So the other, the, the P450 class is uniquely good for those non-native reactions, or do you ever see those being performed with alpha KGs or other? Um, there is, uh, there is one, well, there is that, oh, you want to, you want to specifically nitrine and carbon chemistry or any type of non-native chemistry? Yeah, not any non-native chemistry, I guess, was what I was interested in. Uh, I suppose the, that, that one paper from Jared in 2020, from earlier this year, um, let me, sorry, I need to. Let me go back to that paper quickly. Uh, this paper here from Jared, um, this is using alpha KG enzyme for um, A site transfer. And I think there is also a paper from Xiongyi Huang from Johns Hopkins. Um, for a, I think it was for a CH fluorination, but it's uh, it's using a very engineered substrate. I think the substrate has an N fluoride bond, uh, and it's an intramolecular. It's like an H HLF type reaction, but with um, but with uh, but for fluorination and intramolecular. For those types of radicals. Mm -hmm. uh, radical CH extraction. So, yes. There's a question from uh, Chiaoyu Jenny, who is a uh, member of the U lab. I don't know if you can read it. No, I'll repeat it here. Apart from those, she says, I, uh, thank you for the interesting lecture. I have a naive question. Apart from those key organometallic catalysts, the active site or the protein environment also play key roles in anti activity. I'm just curious are there any general rules or considerations you need to take into account when choosing? appropriate protein for designing an artificial power. Yeah, I think that that's an interesting question. Um, if you look at the examples I provided, it uh, looks like the most popular approach is to find scaffold that has big cavities to accommodate your um, organometallic complex. Um, but one thing that I probably should note about this type of construct is that they cannot necessarily mimic the dynamics of uh, natural proteins, right? Um, as it's kind of alluded in the um, P450 oxidation chemistry, usually there is some type of um, open and closing of certain domains and um, um, dynamics of the of certain residues that make the reaction work very efficiently. And you cannot mimic this process uh, easily by uh, using this artificial metal enzyme. And I think that's why the usually the turnover number or the, or the activity is rather low. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. I guess it's also and, and still somewhat guided just based on what for the artificial metal enzyme stuff, like what you can, what I mean, I guess so much of the work is guided by the scrub avid and interaction. Yep. Just, yep. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily because it's a good scaffold, but because the, the, the non covalent yes, right. right. Yeah, because it's very convenient to uh, anchor your organometallic complex that way. But I guess it's a little bit of a double edged sword. It's like if you yep. go that route, that, that environment might not be great. If you try to go the Jared route, then you need to build in a lot of other bells and whistles. And right. Mm -hmm. Once so you have just the evolution becomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you see that in some of these constructs, they have to use um, non canonical amino acid incorporation uh, so that they can. Uh, anchor their organometallic complex into the 
active site of the enzyme. And then one, one, just one, one more general question I have that has, has come up just in ORP and other discussions is, are all of the, like I'm looking at the copper example that you showed with BIPI, and that's one where it seems like the coordination of BIPI to copper could be, you could imagine it to be kind of dynamic under the reaction conditions, whereas a lot of the other cases, you have some ligand. Yes, but... I see it where it's like it's definitely going to be locked in there. You're not uh -huh. going to have the, the metal diffusing in and out of the active site to any extent. Sorry, I guess my, I guess to clarify, what I was getting at is that um, because you're using proteins that are not designed to perform this function, um, the dynamics of the dynamic, the protein dynamics might not be there to help assist in the catalysis. Whereas in the in the the other approach by starting from natural enzymes is that um, it's been evolved to perform catalysis from years and years of evolution, right? Yeah, I guess my question still comment was just about the. the uh, so far, most of the artificial metabolic enzymes that have been successful rely on quite strong coordination between them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh -huh. uh, some of the other transformations that could, in principle, be interesting, but involve weaker metal ligand coordination or, or mm -hmm. dynamic coordination chemistry. Yeah. That's more of a still something on the horizon. But normal enzymes themselves, normal metal enzymes, natural metal enzymes, is how much active shuttling of, of the metal into those binding sites are there in the cases where they're a little bit more loosely held? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a limit and depends on the type of reaction you want to do. You want to do cross couplings, I don't think you can repurpose a natural enzyme for a sp3 sp3 cross coupling and if you want to do that you probably have to go the artificial metal enzyme route and but um, you probably will get some uh, activity but if you want to bump it up to really useful level, I think that would have, that would require very extensive optimization. Question from uh, Alex Blados, member of the Baron Group and Bryce uh, alum. He says, great lecture, how's goals? I was wondering if there's been much work towards engineering enzymes for selective oxidative beta couplings on peptide scaffolds similar to Lauren Capo's work with copper and iron clusters if my computer just died. So I guess I can catch the rest of my question, Alex, if you just want to read the rest of your question. Um, is this, so is this in the context of bi-aerial couplings? Yeah, I guess by our old CC, CO, CN, and then also sort of in line with that, you know, are there special considerations that need to be taken when you start working with increasingly large substrates? Like you start to get into, you know, peptides with a, you know, 15, 1500 molecular weight, you know, do you have to start engineering larger and larger pockets or, you know, what's the workflow for that look like? Um, for oxidative couplings um, or, 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 the oxidative coupling for bi bond formations, there are P450s that can do that. Um, and I think there are lac cases that do this reaction, but lac cases are not very selective. So I think the P450s are better. Um, Alison Narayan has a, ha, has a paper from a few years ago on uh, using P450s for um, bi aryl couplings. Uh, and with regards to reactions on big substrates, I don't know if there is a consensus in the field because if you think about it, if you have like a 
molecular weight of 1500, that would be very hard to fit into any active site pockets. Uh, and I don't know too many examples where you can um, do this uh, coupling um, on such large substrates. Um, I would think that you have to kind of um, unravel the substrate a little bit and then um, the enzyme would just have to need to just have to be able to accommodate um, some parts of the substrate while leaving most of it outside of the binding binding pocket or things like that. Um, yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. Let's see if there are any additional questions, but we are a few minutes over, so perhaps it's a good time to wrap things up. Uh, let's thank Hans again for a fabulous lecture. Thank you. We are a reminder about the Wikipedia articles due Friday. Let's call it midnight. Uh, let us know if you have any questions between now and then.